Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the April meeting of the Manufacturing and Supply Chain Management Collaborative. We're so excited to see so many people from all of New Jersey on the line today. And we've got an incredible program um, with a, an exceptional speaker, a couple of exceptional speakers, and then some breakout rooms so we can engage in some robust discussion. Um, the theme for this meeting is experiential learning, and I think we all agree from our own experiences and from the research literature and all of the experiences we collectively bring to the table, how important it is to provide students with an opportunity to use what they are learning in the classroom on the job, apply it in different ways, and how important that is to students' ability to gain skills, to learn more about career opportunities, and to transition to good quality family supporting careers. So we're really excited that all of you are here today to join with us in this conversation. I'm Aaron Fickner, president of the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. And um, again, happy to see so many of you doing um, such incredible work and willing to come together in new ways to make sure that we have a highly skilled and innovative workforce for these two really intertwined and important industries in our state. So with that, very brief opening remarks. I'd like to turn it over to Glenn Best. Glenn is our Director um, of Strategy in Manufacturing and Supply Chain. Good morning, Glenn. I'll give it to you from here on out. Good morning. Good morning, Aaron, and thank you uh, for that introduction, and thank you for your leadership in this important work of the, the New Jersey Pathways to Career Initiative. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Regina Arrington, uh, CEO for the Clinton Global Initiative University, where she leads the work to deepen engagement with the next generation of leaders on college campuses around the world. Prior to her appointment at CGIU, she served as a Senior Director for Regional Impact for Leadership for Educational Equity, overseeing the New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and National Capital Regions. Prior to, prior to the Leadership for Education Equity, she served as Director of Community Partnerships for Teach for America where she cultivated relationships and partnerships with community, city, and state stakeholders. She also lent her diversity, equity, and inclusion expertise to serve as the DEI facilitator for first-year educators. In her passion work, she is the Director of Partnerships and Co-Investment Strategies with Unbox Philanthropy Advisors, where she supports foundations, nonprofits, in actualizing their philanthropic ob objectives with a strong focus on social justice. In Arrington's previous tenure with the foundation, she created and expanded the Clinton Global Initiative, Clinton Global University uh, Network, which provided skilled mentorship and over $3 million of fiscal support to student experiential projects around the globe. Welcome, Regina. I'd like to begin by asking you, why is experiential learning so important to industry today? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I think my video is lagging a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, thank you for your grace with tech as always. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. And, you know, the question about experiential learning, to me, it's very clear. Um, we, we live in a world where uh, a traditional four-year education was doing a lot for, for individuals, but not everything. Um, and young people were entering the um, career space with not a lot of actual tactical skills. Um, that's something we were seeing for sure with our student body, um, but even in a more granular way with the interns that we were leveraging, we were working with interns going to some of the best universities um, in the US. However, we were finding that their actual skill set was a little bit lower when it came to executing projects and, and getting work done. Uh, so for me, and definitely I think for the CGI University community, um, what we've seen is that experiential learning is the way for us to both get our students uh, upskilled. Um, and then for us, we are focused on social justice issues. So not only getting our students upskilled, but getting them um, onboarded into what the world actually looks like and where they can make impactful, tangible change. And to me, experiential learning is that through line. Um, what we call it actually is a commitment to action. So same thing, different words, um, but our students commit to taking some kind of tangible action in their backyard, in their neighborhood, tying together what they've learned at university with things that will actually change the outcomes and impact and possibilities in their communities. That's a that's an important aspect about tying those those 
learning experience in with the community with the communities. So both a the the impact on the employer side, but also the social impact to the communities that uh, that we we live in. Um, we know that a key component of experiential learning requires uh, on-site supervision and and or some mentoring teaching relationship with the student who is participating. What what are some strategies that you would suggest that schools use to develop or expand their experiential learning um, ex, um, programs? Yes, I think you know schools. We always talk about being under resourced. Every every space talks discusses being under resourced, and I think unfortunately the first place where we take resources away is a mentorship model, is that near peer or um, near educator experience with an actual student. So to me, it is hugely important uh, to ensure that all of our students have someone to talk to, have someone to brainstorm with, have someone to talk about um, the issues that they're trying to solve for, but they wanna speak with people who of course have a little bit of experience in that space. So. Um, De the technique, I think, is not to cut the resources <laughs> when it comes time to look at our balance sheet and figure out where we think uh, the most good is happening and and we're having the most impact on our students. Nine times out of ten, it is those one-on-one -on -one moments where we have a student sitting down in a classroom with an educator or we're just one-on-one -on -one online, just like we are now. Um, kind of getting those big gems uh, of how do you problem solve, how do you navigate bureaucracy, how do you leverage some of the soft skills um, that I think we kind of teach around uh, to, to actually move things and projects forward. So to me, the big thing is do not cut um, any of the mentorship programs that you have, and indeed invest in them. Um, and something I saw that I think is very important is the near peer model. So leveraging upperclassmen, if you have them, or people who have matriculated out of the community college space to come back and support students who are just navigating that world. What we've always seen, especially at CGIU is, I can say all the things in the world, right? I can give you the best practices, give you the tips, tricks, and tools, but our students, you know, they don't, they don't see it for me any longer. I am no longer their peer. However, when a student who graduated four or five years um, ahead of the current students come back and say the same exact things, we see the information register in a different way. We see their eyes light up and we see the engagement that they have with those younger folks um, to be way higher than uh, some, some individuals who are a little older, a little bit more seasoned in their career. Outstanding. Um, oh, I'm, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. Yes, you can raise, thank, yes, sorry you can about that. raise your volume a little bit. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Is this better? Uh, yes, that is, is better. Right. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Uh, how how does CGI U assist schools with incorporating experiential learning into their individual schools? Yes. Uh, so we have something that's called the CGI University Network, um, and this we 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 came up with this back in I want to say 2012. Uh, because we were seeing that we were while we were engaging a huge amount of students we would have over a thousand students coming to our week-long conference and they were coming from all 50 states about 90 different countries all for them to solve a, a, a social justice issue we were finding that we were having a difficult time supporting them on their campuses because our model is um, bringing everyone together not necessarily seating individual um, incubators on campus so what we developed was the university network, which was a um, group of universities across the board, community colleges, um, Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and um, universities, um, predominantly black institutions, Ivy Leagues, uh, public schools that are regular four-year institutions. So truly the gamut of universities were agreeing to put aside $10,000 to support their students in both getting to our learning space, which was a conference, but then also giving our students a little bit of seed funding. Um, and what we did was build a full incubator program through one or two university contacts who were executing all of this programming on their individual campuses. So while we weren't doing that kind of programming, what we saw was a, a, um, a grouping about 70, when I'd left, I believe we're at 40 now, um, but when I left, we had about 70 individual campuses running mini incubators on their campuses uh, just to get students kind of upskilled and getting them a little bit more support in their program execution. So for us, it was figuring out how did we leverage our networks 
Oh, 47. Thank you, Cassie. And Cassie is my uh, colleague. She's currently over that programming now, so she will definitely adjust my data <laughs> as I say the wrong things in real time. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, in thinking about how are we building uh, communities of practice, really, um, that was one of the first large communities of practice we developed and built uh, with our universities. Additionally, we have something called our Commitment Mentor Program. And Cassie, feel free to throw the number in the chat. Um, I believe we have about 60 commitment mentors. Again, they are the near peers, people who have done this work. Yes, I did it all right. <laughs> These people who have done this work already, um, who have had their own commitments to action, who have been successful in implementing their projects, they've come back and they are now volunteering with us to support our current student body. So we have two uh, models of supporting our students. One is with the university network, more tied to their university space so that their universities know what we're doing, know what the programming is. And then the other is this near peer model where we're leveraging past CJU commitment makers who are now fully experts in their field, but have a really great understanding of what CJU was and how to navigate CJU, but then of course uh, the world outside of CJU University. Thank you, Regina. One of the things that's critical to, to the pathway work of our initiative is the engagement with our industry um, leadership, our industry representatives in the four, four industry sectors that our Pathways Initiative um, is engaged with. Uh, so what would you recommend to our, our educational partners, our educational ecosystem of community colleges and, and our, our uh, K through 12 institutions, our four institutions, as relates to how to really engage these experiential learning programs with our with our employers what would be the 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 value uh that they could present uh to an, to a representative around the importance of experiential learning yes i think i think we get caught up in the buzzwords especially in education spaces um we love our language in education in, in, for good or for bad right um, I think what we all need to do a little bit better is to um, do some code switching. We need to line up how we speak about our students, how we speak about their learning experiences. We call it experiential learning. That's also an apprenticeship. It's also an internship. There are a lot of words that um, that 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 coincide with what experiential learning is, and I think we on our practitioner side need to do a little bit more due diligence to speak the language of industry. Um, and yes, I, I think that's really the biggest hurdle because at the end of the day, we know industry wants our students, period. But what we're having a difficult time doing is um, creating a bridge between the two spaces uh, and, and making sure that our students are consistently being pulled into these industry spaces. So I do think it's, it's an issue of language more than anything else. That's that's a great observation, and I think you you touched on a, a very valid point about um, sometimes the 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 language and the, and the terminology and it may be uh, speaking a different a different tone a different language around because you're right employers do need the talent and the value of exponential learning basically it, it aligns with all these pathways that we're that we're discussing whether it's whether it's internships whether it's apprenticeships. Um, but some component of a what, what you would call a an actual hands on learning approach to engagement with with industry. I think that's very important. Thank you for that. Um, let me just make sure that there aren't any questions in the chat. Uh, this is this is wonderful uh, discussion. And, and and I know that the, the uh, CGI universities is having a a program coming up with with the, the Association of Community Colleges. Uh, uh, is is that will 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 this topic be part of that discussion? Um, yes, actually. Uh, so while we cannot announce who's going to be speaking, you will all please check out our um, <laughs> our outlets. And Cassie, can you do me a favor and drop our social media handles in the chat? Um, so a couple of things. What you're seeing up on the screen um, are just a, a brief overview of what we're doing and how we recontextualize what experiential learning is, we call it a commitment to action. Um, and we say that we want you to come up with a new specific and measurable uh, plan of action in one of our five focus areas, which are education, 
environment and climate change, peace and human rights, poverty alleviation, and public health. So we are very, very broad. Um, and because of that, the, the broad nature of the topics that we work with, we can usually work with all kinds of students. Um, and can you do the next slide, please? Let's see. I, yes, this one. So these are some examples of students from multidisciplinary backgrounds um, and what they've created. So we have something here called the Lucky Iron Fish um, and very simple solution to an issue. Uh, this is a piece of iron that when put in a pot of rice uh, enriches the rice and the water. Uh, so it starts to solve uh, problems of nutrient deficiency for um, spaces that don't have access to that. Uh, so that's public health, but clearly a couple of other things. Agro360, um, this idea, this experiential project um, utilizes AI to analyze conditions of crops and improve the agricultural productivity of underserved um, farmers and spaces. So again, this is environment and climate change, but leads right into workforce, excuse me, it leads right into supply chain. Uh, so again, tying that to what industry looks like, how are you Im implementing um, changes for supply chain access? Um, then we have ScholarJet, which is a commitment to increase access to STEM education and experiential learning through scholarships. So this is education focused, um, but what we're doing is trying, again, the students are advocating to upskill what STEM education looks like. And of course, what we're talking about, period, experiential learning, because we know this is where all the great things happen. Um, so this year, we will be partnering with the American Association of Community Colleges to do our big year-end programming um, grouping. So it's going to be actually uh, this upcoming Monday, uh, April 11th through April 13th, and we are going to have our opening conversation, I believe, at 12 o'clock on um, Monday morning. So if you are available and you can, please hop on um, our website. We're also streaming on Facebook Live. Um, and you can just see the conversation happening. However, what's happening on the other side of that is we have about 900 students, um, alumni, and, and higher education professionals engaging with us on something that we're calling our hop-in platform. So for the external audiences, you'll be able to access our larger plenary spaces, but there's a whole host of networking, connecting. Um, students will be exhibiting some of their commitments to action in that space. So we will have something else happening, uh, not to the side in, in the, at the same time um, as our plenaries, but want to just tell you all, would love to have you, your schools, join to the plenary sessions. Glenn, I know you sent this um, language out already, so we're just trying to do a better job of um, welcoming more and more community colleges into our space as we're growing the programming. Uh, one last question, Regina. What has been the most challenging issues to initiate experiential learning experiences and connecting education and community and, and industry partners? Yes, I think uh, the, the the difficult thing is, and I hate to come down to this again. It's again, it's resources. It's what is our bottom line going to? How is our bottom line going to be impacted here? Um, and on, I think more than anything, us clarifying the how of how are we connecting our students to uh, industry spaces and honestly the impact on the bottom line of the institutions how is this something that is going to um, support the business model of that space i think it's going to be back on institutions universities and um, community colleges to clarify what that value proposition is for employers so uh, again going back to our career services spaces um, as we're developing um, some of these these handoffs from you being in school into or an apprenticeship or an internship, et cetera, into you getting into some of these uh, other uh, spaces of industry. What is that through line? What does that look like? Um, we, of course, have these huge companies that run huge uh, internship programs. If it's the big five um, uh, finance firms, if it's Bain, if it's um, Deloitte, you know, we have students who really hustle just to get those internships, and then they have a full career pathway after they've interned a couple of years. I think it would be interesting for um, us as, as, as universities and institutions, nonprofits, to kind of coalesce and, and solidify some of those things outside of um, the actual in, uh, companies so that we can be clear that we think this is the vision and maybe their HR departments or their hiring uh, departments can just take up what we're talking about and move forward. Thank you so much, Regina. That that was wonderful. We, we, I'm sure there's gonna be a number of other uh, questions that will come up later from, from our uh, attendees, uh, but 
th this was a wonderful discussion and I appreciate you taking time to, to share your insights uh, with us today. Uh, with that, I wanna transition to our next segment of our program our, and introduce our next uh, speaker, um, Ariel Daniels, who is the coordinator for the, uh, the outreach coordinator um, for New Jersey Transit for the internship program. Uh, she coordinates the program, it provides opportunities annually for students enrolled in post-secondary institutions in pretty much all segments of the New Jersey Transit business operations, everything from, from production to engineering, to human resources, to health services. Um, and we're grateful that she has joined us today along with one of her interns, uh, Fatima Quillcat. Uh, so good morning, uh, Ariel and Fatima. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, great, great. Okay. Testing out this new headset. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here um, to represent New Jersey Transit. Uh, we love the relationship that we have with Glenn, and we hope that um, you know we're able to shed some light as to the you know program, the robust program that we've been offering. Um, so, uh, am I supposed to share my screen or? No, we'll we'll, we'll share a screen, and as um, okay. as we're doing that um I'd like to uh, pose a question to you uh what how did new jersey uh, transit create their internship program or was there do you know what was driving them to create this this program initially well i think uh regina from her a few of her earlier points hit the nail on the head as far as wanting to bridge a gap and wanting to um build more of a more a robust pipeline for talent and um from a more organic perspective right so when we you know my uh, senior outreach director gloria vrabel she's been you know very uh involved in different sectors of our um, organization. So she worked, she dealt with police, she deals with um, corporate, all of talent acquisition. And for her, it was, how can we um, build that talent from within and also still um, be involved in our community initiatives? And so with that, it was, how about, you know, an internship program, which is something that, you know, I don't believe you, that was very uh, much a need. Um, and so we started it uh, a few years ago, we, and it's been growing exponentially uh, since then. Um, so I think it was just really wanting to do what our department, which is talent acquisition, building the talent is really stick to the mission and is building and building and um, really help to do career development. So that's how it got started. Thank you. So in, in that, and, and I, I mentioned this briefly, but I know that the internship program covers a broad range of different departments uh, within New Jersey Transit. What would you say annually, how many interns is New, Tran New Jersey Transit uh, seeking in terms of their candidate pool across the region? Well, that's a great question, Glenn, because I there hasn't been a cap right? Um, we've been just growing. So um, this year alone, we are expected to have one of our largest um, group of interns to date since we started, and that's over 100 interns. And why I say it's no cap is because we started as few as 30, and we've grown over time, even with the pandemic, um, you know, we've still seen a great uh, influx of talented, uh, I would uh, love to say, like, very talented, it's very competitive this year. Um, Fatima can also attest to this, that, you know, we're really, you know, getting a great pool of people. Um, so it's growing, there is no cap. And I think that that's what makes the internship program with New Jersey Transit an amazing opportunity for students. Um, like you were saying, and like the slide that's up, thank you, is I we have a 10 week program um, where we cater to different sectors of our, um, our organization. So from finance to engineering, procurement, um, real estate, um, just something outside of transportation, which I think is really important to mention that, you know, a lot of students, I mean, uh, even with the number that we've gotten, we, we look over 
of two, 2,500 resumes at this point um, to, to weed that out to that 100. But, you know, they find us and in in we're able to expand and let them know that we're more than just a transportation company, human resources, marketing, um, now social media, we've been getting jobs for social media. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry, can you go back one slide? I'm sorry, I, I did want to go into that. But um, so that program um, is 10 weeks. It starts in June through August. And what is an amazing, um, amazing thing about it is for the perks for students. Most companies, you go to an internship program and you finish with them after that, that period of summer, fall, spring. What we do, which is again, to Regina's point, she, she did a great presentation, by the way, is that um, we keep the, we love to retain our interns to continue to help them develop and to, you know, hone in on their skills. So obviously you have to be matriculated in school, which it says there, um, but we, we love to keep you. So if it's something where, you know, we have it in our budget and we have the position, we, we love to in the, in the long run, hire you as a full-time employee with New Jersey Transit and, you know, in that department that you have been skilled to do. And um, even with the program, what makes it so robust is that um, we don't just um, have it be for undergraduate students. It's also for graduate students. It's also, you know, for those students who may be um, have switched a major or two and they um, may need to do extra semester. We still keep them eligible. So it's the idea is not to have you not do a, a, a you know experience like this is to to give you that opportunity and to really work with you um, we've expanded to uh, virtual opportunities as well due to the pandemic and it's worked out well for international students especially and then we also obviously it's a paid opportunity and we love to think that you know based on the majors and the skills that you plan to go to with the competitive market that it will be um, to that point um, we're trying to you know, as an organization, you know, give you the, the compensation that you will likely receive upon graduation from school. And so uh, next slide, Fatima could kind of go into the majors. Hi everyone, my name is Fatima. I'm an intern at NJ Transit. So as you guys can see, um, and Ariel mentioned, we're not only a, a transportation company where, you know, most of our interns and like myself, um, when I applied to NJ Transit, um, I thought out of less train and light rail. So um, we are so much more beyond that. As you guys can see, we have um, so many majors and we have um, more and growing 11,000 employees at NG Transit. And we give that opportunity to our interns and myself um, to grow and um, us, uh, get a full-time or part-time uh, um, uh, employment at NJ Transit. So um, I, I think it's an, an amazing opportunity that they give students. Thank you. Uh, is Was there one more slide or? Yes, okay. So this is my favorite part of the presentation, right? So um, the reason why I love the internship program is also to speak to that bridge, building that gap um, and, and also just the hands-on experience of it. It's not just, you know, running, getting coffee errands and, and, and following behind the hiring managers. And you really get a hands-on experience. Um, if, if, if you had time or if anybody wanted to speak to Fatima um, longer about it, she can tell you. She's literally run, helping to run the internship program. She's a human resource intern with me. So, you know, that is just a testament of it. We do speaking to mentorship that you mentioned earlier, um, that, you know, we, we have lunch and learns with our executives and our board directors where they get to really um, pick their brain and see how, what their journey and how they got to where they are, um, help them with resume writing, career building, kind of those soft and hard skills that were mentioned earlier. Um, and um, then we also like to, you know, have you step outside, you know, the office life of where you are, um, because we do have it, we do have it be specific to where you, where your major is, so that you could kind of just hone in on those skills, and um, 
we we take a break from that and you know if you were like to have some fun and see what else is going on in the organization what you see here for the police site tour counterterrorism uh, uh training facility is a simulation of what you know the day in the life of the new jersey transit police office uh system works and how they operate and it's just you know a way to show different areas of the uh, uh internship program in different areas of the organization um and this overall the program is to give you a you know a lifelike reality for those 10 weeks of what it is like to be out in the real world out you know away from mom dad away from you know books um and and to really uh, no, hey, is this what I want to do with my career? And if you, if, and if it's not, great, totally fine. At least you ch check that off your list. I think this generation is very, um, is very keen on understanding that if if they don't like something, they're gonna figure out, they're gonna figure it out quick and move on. And I think that we're trying to keep up with that and understand that that's a great way to figure out, you know, how to find where you should be or where you would like to be professionally. That's a good point, Ariel. Uh, thank you for that. We had a question uh, from from one of the attendees who who was asking. Um, how long i know you mentioned a few years since since new jersey transit launched the the internship program i don't know if you know exactly how many years it's been and then amongst so you and you but you and you also referenced that you, right now you have 100 uh or so um um interns uh what has been the the retention of those those interns as it relates to their engagement with new, new jersey transit you did mention that some people may decide Hey, this is not for them. But what what have you all seen is is a as a pattern? Has the retention been? Do you have any any idea of what that retention looks like for those individuals who have come through the internship program? Okay, so the program itself has started fall of twenty eighteen, so we're fairly new. Um, and so, but it stands the test of time that over those years, over those few years, we have, like I said, started from 15, 20, um, and, and really trying to figure out what the program could be to now 100 today. Um, as far as retention, I can't speak to the 100 because they haven't started yet, and this is the first time we've marked that number. But as far as retention in general, I would say that we have a good 25%, so a quarter of that our last rate, which was 80, um, that stayed with us and we've extended them, um, which is a great uh, percentage um, to, to continue to grow. Um, and I think it was more so how we tailored it as well. So for example, you know, some of these, the reason for that could be because they are, they were already juniors, already seniors. Um, you know, we had to start speaking with our hiring managers about, hey, um, you know, those undergrads who may have just started, who may have just declared are just as great um, un uh, undergraduate professionals than those you think that are graduating. And you get to, you know, help them grow longer and continue that relationship. So it was more of a conversation, but um, yes, that that's where I think some of that percentage goes. And I think it was a great number and we continue, we plan to continue to grow. Understand it. We uh, we had another question um, regarding our our community college partners. Um, it, is New Jersey Transit working with our our um, our eighteen community colleges in terms of the internship program, or is there uh, regular communication with with the? I, I don't know how New Jersey Transit communicates the the, the program out uh, statewide. That's yes. Okay. So I'm a fellow, I mean, this is um, an undergrad four year for me, but I'm a Rutgers, okay? I'm a Scarlet Knight uh, through and through statewide. So my whole goal, um, and Fatima goes to New Jersey City University and she's completing her master's. And so we are very keen on, you know, making sure that we get our uh, New Jersey students in. As far as community colleges like Essex County, Mercer County, we do have relationships with them. We host um, regular uh, uh, info sessions with them. Uh, obviously, it got a little uh, skewed because of uh, COVID. So, you know, sometimes they could only accommodate in-person um, 
you know, uh, college fairs, et cetera, turnouts on their end as well, because students, you know, are just trying to be more aware of their health, which is fine. Um, but we do definitely have those relationships and we're building. And there's definitely a few more, sorry if I'm talking fast. There's definitely a few other uh, community colleges that we have uh, relationships as well um, that we've already been um, nurturing so for sure and and if there is and if there's a school um that we that you would like to make mention of I would definitely love to build that relationship I think that's a great thing as well to note for um my department um that we we always take an informational meeting um we, we do them often to, to continue to build, if, if it's a program that we can do, if it's a, you know, an info session to, to just share what we do with New Jersey Transit for later years, we, we are definitely open to that and we love that relationship. Thank you, Ariel. If you would, if you would um, provide your contact information in the chat, that would be wonderful. Uh, one reason, and, and, that, and that was one of the reasons why that question was so important, when we talked about all the different areas that New Jersey Transit has internship opportunities, I don't know how many of our schools realized that nursing was one of your internship areas. If they would have equated nursing with New Jersey Transit, and right, one of the and of course there's other areas, but I, I just mentioned that as an example. And, yes. and we a number of our community colleges have nursing programs, so we we certainly want to connect. Um, um, our schools, and, 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 and I appreciate the fact that you're working with a couple of our schools now. We would like to expand it through, through all of our schools. So thank you. Thank you for that. Of course. And, and thank you, for Fatima, for giving us your personal insights as, a, as, a, uh, as an intern. Uh, we, we look forward to your, your continued success uh, there as well. Um, thank you. We're going to now transition to our, our breakout sessions. Those of you who have questions for, for um, Ariel, please feel free to to um, to uh, connect with her. She put her information in the chat. Um, but we're gonna you're gonna see a prompt, and you can uh, select to uh, go to our breakout sessions where we can continue this discussion and have other additional questions that you may have around both experiential learning and internships. Um, you'll be assigned automatically. So I'll see you in the breakout sessions. Hello, everyone. I'm just waiting for everyone to join um, our breakout room. Uh, we should probably have a few more people, so um, I'll just give it another moment. But these, if you want to take a look, these are the questions that we'll be talking about all in relation to experiential learning. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Sandra Blackman. I'm the Director of Strategy and Workforce Partnerships for the health services sector. And with me um, from the council is Stephanie Samuel. Stephanie, do you want to just say hello? There she is. She's the program coordinator for, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, how, how are all of you? I am the program manager for health services um, and for infrastructure and energy. So it's a pleasure to see all of you today. And if everyone could please, uh, so we know who's in the room with us, put your name and title in the chat, that would be great. And then um, we're going to start the discussion uh, around these questions. So if you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Um, and we'll, uh, when you speak, if you could just let us know your name and title again, so we know who's talking. So um, let's see how many, we have about 11 people. We'll give it another second, I guess. And uh, we'll let everyone come in, so. Thank you. What great speakers today. It's so interesting to learn about internship opportunities, um, like Port Authority, like thinking about nursing in our health services sector, Stephanie, I was really, uh, you know, it's interesting to see. So it's so nice to have um, such wonderful speakers to help us uh, learn about new opportunities. Okay, great, everyone's putting their, uh, information, their contact, their name and title in the chat. And I'm going to uh, just ask the first question and then I'll take the slide down just so we can all see each other that we feel like we're in the room together. Um, but we're going to, let's get started in the interest of time because we only have about 15 minutes. We want to be conscious of everyone's time today. Um, and so in the theme of experiential learning, we'd like to hear, does your organization have an experiential learning best practice um, currently? And let me stop sharing. And if you'd like to share, just raise your hands and you know we can, we can start the discussion. Okay, we have our first. 
Okay. Um, Are you able to unmute her? I am trying, but it's oh, sorry. Okay, there you are. Okay, hello. Hi, how are you? Zahira Sabir from Bronx County Workforce Development Board. Um, so I believe this falls in the realm of experiential learning, but we have actually implemented a youth program um, uh, for employment enrichment over the summer, and it's called Destination Career. Um, it, we first had our pilot year in 2019 in connection with our local community college. And so we designed a program where we expose participants who were of um, demographics that had barriers to employment. So maybe an identified disability or you know something like that, um, where they were strategically exposed to the growing industries in our area, like you know IT, um, CLD, et cetera. So it was extremely um, impactful and successful. And a lot of them, one of them actually got an internship with one of our local employers after post-graduation. Um, so, but unfortunately the roadblock, I, could, I can kind of do a twofer, was the <laughs> pandemic. And we weren't able to do it in person um, for the last two years. Um, but we were able to pivot to a virtual world with that, exposing them to employers last year, um, specifically outreaching to um, those in some of our juvenile detention facilities and you know um, areas like that, where they were still able to participate in Destin Destination Career. We're hoping to be able to get back into an in-person format though. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, when we think about experiential learning, it's more than just an internship, right? There are so many other touch points that can mean experiential learning. Um, and you brought up a good point regarding the pandemic being a roadblock, but also allowing, I know we work with another pharma company that is now, all of their internships are virtual and it gives um, a wider student uh, you know, group, maybe from a Northern part of New Jersey who maybe couldn't have experienced that internship, right? Because they're based in Princeton. So it has its pluses and its minuses, uh, but thank you for sharing. Um, Jackie? Can you unmute Jackie? I'm sorry, I had to okay. unmute myself. So um, slightly, well, we have a nationally recognized service learning program. So it's the amount of hours in a service learning, I'm, I'm going to assume most people are familiar with service learning. It's a volunteer activity tied to your curriculum. Who are you with Jackie? Sorry. If oh, just... Raritan Valley Community College. Okay, thank you. So, Traditionally, service learning has always, when you think about it, you think it attached to academic courses. But we have, because we have such a successful model, we've taken the service learning model and incorporated it into our workforce programs. Um, so it's less intensive than, in, than an internship. It's probably maybe 30 hours in total for the semester. But um, it's, it's very successful. It introduces students, you know, they, they think of what they're doing in a different way. One example is through our cosmetology program. They do a service learning where they um, provide exams to detect, uh, you know, problems with your skin or, or cancer, things of that nature. Um, even abuse, because many times physical abuse um, manifests itself in areas that you can't see that are covered up with either makeup or hair or things of that nature. So um, we're, lo we're looking for ways to implement it in workforce programs. And I think the second question said, you know, what are some of the difficulties we've encountered? Um, and I think sometimes having the employer, whether it's for an internship or a service learning opportunity, understand their obligation to the student um, is hard to get through because sometimes they think of it as like, oh, I'm just going to get like some help. But they don't understand that, there, that there's guidance and there's learning objectives and, and, and there's mentorship. So there's, there's a lot of things that go along with taking a student. And then the other thing is that and this kind of falls with some of the topics that we talked about today um, with diversity, equity, and inclusion. You, you know, we're very careful at community college. We create these very, I'm just going to use safe environments, right? Where we um, are very careful on 
on the climate that our students operate in. And then when you send your student out to an organization, you don't really know firsthand what the climate there is. And so it's very important that like you tell the student what's sort of acceptable behaviors, even in a workplace, right? Because you, we don't want to put our students in, I don't want to use the word hostile because that's too strong, but you know, in environments that, that are not quite up to our standard. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Jackie. I think, you know, the service learning is interesting and it, you bring up a, a good point. And I know I have been to RVCC's, uh, their cosmetology and the little salon that they have, which I think is amazing. Right. Um, and that, I mean, you really can't uh, get more uh, real than experiential learning in, in, you know, that's salon and spa. Right. Um, so thank you. Does anyone else have, um, you know, to answer question one, have any you know, best practices or, you know, with their experience. Oh, Amber, let me just unmute you. Hi, everyone. Um, I know actually most of the people in this group and they're actually already, a lot of them are partners with us on this, but um, apprenticeships is what our main goal is under the Career Advanced USA grant. Um, I particularly work with the advanced manufacturing apprenticeships, but we also um, are a partner on Bergen's grant and we do healthcare as well. Um, so, I mean, the obvious stopper has been COVID. Of course, we got started right when COVID hit. Um, but I think now that <clears throat> more and more things are opening up, we're able to expand our program more. Um, and I think it was just also a learning curve of certain things. You know, you write a grant and expect everything to, you thought you thought it out well enough. Um, and then all of a sudden something throws you a curveball and you have to change things. But I think that, um, you know, I just recently visited all of our partners, been talking to them about their individual programs. Um, and it's a really great way to get people into, you know, a job quickly. Um, with some training. So it's, it, I've really enjoyed the experience with the apprenticeships. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, apprenticeships are, we don't think about them as, you know, because it's that on the job component, but we don't think about it as experiential learning, right? But it really is, um, you know, part of that. And I think you bring us to our second question, which is about roadblocks. Uh, we started talking about the pandemic, but um, did anyone else experience any other type of roadblocks in their experiential learning um, implementation or any of, uh, you know, any of their programs? I guess the pandemic was the biggest roadblock we've seen. Um, and, and I think to your point too, Amber, we, we write things or we pro do these programs, but we never expected a pandemic, right? So it really, um, it, it kind of, it was a very, it altered things in a lot of ways, but it did also bring us, you know, the ability to, and I think even the meetings that we're having here, the collaboratives, um, it, maybe we wouldn't have 70 people on the line if we were, you know, in person at Middlesex College, right? Um, it gives a togetherness throughout the state that we didn't have before and affords opportunities for experiential learning that maybe, or internships that maybe students didn't have previously. Um, anyone else want to comment on roadblocks or best practices before I move on? Um, you know, does anyone have a particular success story that they'd like to share? Um, I know we kind of touched on a few things. They're all, all these questions are all related, you know, as far as the experiential learning, but if there's a best, you know, best practice or success story, um, I thought it was great that we had one of the students on from the Port Authority today. That was wonderful. Um, so Carol, hold on, let me, Carol always has a, a success story. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So um, this has to do with the healthcare grant. Uh, we're with Bergen's grant. And uh, we had one of our certified medical um, assistant students did her externship with one of the um, employers that we're partnering with. And um, well, we have a lot of success because they do, um, just like New Jersey Transit said, a lot of the employers then hire them on. So this particular student, um, they hired her and then they actually entered her into the um, apprenticeship program. And she just, um, she's been doing great. They said she's like the star, star employee there. And um, she just recently completed the apprenticeship. So we finally have one completer for the healthcare, which was really awesome. 
That's amazing. It's wonderful. It's I mean, I keep saying Port Authority because it's New Jersey, New Jersey Transit. I have Port Authority on the brain. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, that's a wonderful story. I love hearing success stories, right? I love seeing our students uh, succeed and with new programs, especially, right? Um, and when, as we move forward with some of these grants and new programs and the pathways that we're developing, it'll be so exciting to see um, experiential learning and internship opportunities that come from our collaborations uh, and these meetings that we're hosting every month. Uh, does anyone else want to share a success story? I know we have plenty in this, uh, this little Zoom room that we could share. Okay, go ahead. Uh, let me just, and I apologize, I don't know your first name, so if you could just introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Roy Ridings. I'm the uh, Toolmakers Apprentice Manager at the uh, Wysaw Group in East Hanover, oh. New Jersey. So we are manufacturing and technical. Uh, I'm a, not sure why I'm in this group. I'm assuming being we're talking, it's based on the fact that we're talking about uh, uh, experiential learning, mm -hmm. even though you're all mostly in healthcare. So that, you know, doesn't quite matter. What I wanted to say is, uh, this is not a specific su success, but uh, the fact that the state and the federal government have come up with all this available grant money for multiple career disciplines over the last four or five years with all the uh, workforce development boards, I think is a success story. Um, especially as Amber knows, because Amber and I are, you know, I'm one of her supporters for CCM. I think it helps the smaller companies a lot who want to make that transition to getting a formal apprenticeship or a formal experiential learning program, whereas they may have been on the fence before. Um, our company has been doing this for over 40 years, regardless of, you know, tool and die maker apprenticeships, regardless of the grant monies that have been available. So it is a nice incentive to see that government and the workforce development boards are finally getting behind this at you know the high school level and or the intermediate college level for those kids or candidates that don't want a formal four-year education. That's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Amber saying that she agrees. And it's nice to have industry partners in the room. And I think to your point also, we have community college partners in the room that deal with healthcare as well as uh, manufacturing. I know Carol is very involved in the manufacturing space as well. Um, and so some of our community college partners do handle, and we do have two um, grants, the Health Works, and then also for the manufacturing that are, so they, they're probably both focused in both areas. Um, we actually had Dieter from Weissog speak at one of our uh, last year, I think at one of our summits. So I'm familiar with your organization. Um, and, and thank you all for sharing. Uh, does anyone have any other uh, stories they want to share? We're, we're coming up on uh, 1057 and we have about three minutes to go. And so I don't want us to, I hate at the end when the group closes that everyone just, it disappears on me. <laughs> um, so does anyone have any other success stories they'd like to share or, you know, any ideas about experiential learning that they think uh, would be helpful to anyone? quiet on this Wednesday. I did have a question actually just for my own curiosity. Have you all found um, that any students who participated in, in an experience said, decided that they did not like the, the, the career or the profession and ended up going in a different direction? Have, have you found that? It's a great question Stephanie. I can tell it's happened um, in teaching at Fairleigh Dickinson. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I unfortunately, I just had a young gentleman after two years in the program decided that it wasn't a career path for him. And part of it was where he was when he started the program and his age being in the lower 30s, realizing that redefining his career, that the pay wasn't quite enough for where he was at. And that's one of the things we see is with the current you know, lower end pay scale being so unbalanced right now because everybody needs, you know, everybody needs employers when you have Amazon and this is not to turn the key at Amazon, but you know, when they're offering 20 people, 
$20 an hour to start with no experience, that makes it very hard to keep uh, you know, economies of scale in a company that has a hierarchy of paying people that are partially experienced. So unfortunately he left because he found something that was gonna start him at a higher pay, but also because he decided after two years, it was not the career path for him. So just throwing more money at him wouldn't have helped. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's, that's very far and few between that that happens for us though. I think there's always, uh, you know, someone who may get into the work and realize it's not for them, right? But one of the things that we're doing through the pathways is really educating people on what are the pathways and the, not only the career opportunities, but salaries that go with that, right? Because there's, there seems to be in the past, there was a big disconnect on what will I make if I go into this field? I was teaching in a hospitality program and I had students that were you know, saying to me, I can't afford to make that salary. And I said, but that's like your starting salary in this, in this field. So I think, you know, part of our, uh, as educators and the pathways that we're building is to help educate students, what is the career path? You know, maybe you're making this when you start, but if you get this credential or you finish your apprenticeship, you'll be making this in so many years, right? Um, and I think that's important to note. Amber, did you want to share? Um, you said, yes, I saw in the chat. I think it was when I asked the question of if she's had some students. Uh, right, who, who didn't want it, right. Yeah, so, I mean, we've had some students, especially starting with a pre-apprenticeship program. Um, we've had some students go through the program, which I think is, is good because then we're not placing them into an apprenticeship and then changing their mind. We have had a few apprentices do that, um, but we've had some students go through our boot camp program and then either decide it wasn't for them or like Roy was saying, um, you know, we've had students who their current job decided to give them a raise. So they're like, eh, I'm going to just stick with what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, so, and again, I think it's good. We're giving them uh, a taste of it and hopefully then we're weeding most people out before they get to the employers and they really know that they want to do this before they go into a job or an apprenticeship for the most part, you're always going to have some people, but. Uh, thankfully, we haven't really had too many. That's great. Thank you uh, for sharing. I see John joined us. Um, John, since you're here, would you like to say some closing remarks? Uh, I, I know we're over time. I didn't know if you're coming to yell at us. <laughs> we're having we're having such a great discussion. <laughs> and and that's fantastic. And I've been jumping around to all of the different rooms, and there has been some robust discussion. So we do want to thank you for coming. Uh, these collaborative meetings are being held on Wednesdays now. We don't want to take up a full week. So our next one is next Wednesday for technology and innovation. Uh, you'll see that on the screen. The following Wednesday is health sciences. Uh, the 27th will be infrastructure and energy. And we'll be doing it all over again with mm -hmm. manufacturing supply chain uh, starting in May. And uh, Stephanie, Sandra, please refresh my memory. What is the theme for the May collaboratives? I believe that it's prior learning assessments. Um, yes, but I'm... I believe you are correct. Um, and so uh, John put in here in the chat for the next meeting. I also just wanted to share, we will be sending out a survey and your surveys uh, responses are really important to us, especially because today you can see we added a new dynamic of the breakout room. We wanna see you know, your feedback as well. And um, you know, we look forward to having you at the next meeting you know, for manufacturing and you're always welcome to join other, uh, you know, the other collaborative meetings as well. I'm going to stop sharing now so we can all see each other before we go. Um, any last questions, comments, remarks, John, or anything that you'd like to mm -hmm. share? No, just thank you very much for, uh, for attending. Uh, thank you for joining us in the breakout rooms. And we hope to see you not only at uh, next month at our collaborative, but at the other industry collaboratives over the next three Wednesdays. Yes. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Welcome everyone to our breakout session. Um, everyone is muted. So when you um, want to speak, please raise your hands.
Um, we are looking forward to hearing some feedback from all of you and have this opportunity for us to engage in a little um, you know, networking or I guess the like interaction with one another by, by providing some input um, on this important topic of experiential learning. So the three questions we have posed in our breakout session that you are free to answer any of the three. Um, does your organization have experiential learning best practices? Have there been any roadblocks if you've encountered in implementing experiential learning? And do you have any experiential learning success stories, some positive outcomes that you wanna share with the group? So if you could raise your hand, those who would like to provide some information um, and answer some of these questions, we, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, we've already heard from Fatima, so thank you for joining us. And it was great to hear your, your perspective as um, someone who's gone through the internship process with um, New Jersey Transit. Um, but I do see some others here in the room with us. So I'm interested, um, you know, I can call some folks out and ask some, oh, Roberta, there you go. Okay, you can now unmute. Hello. Perfect, Roberta. Um, um, well, so I'm, I'm running through my head that the, we don't have something I'd hold up as a sort of global best practice, but we have a lot of things that we're trying to develop as best practice and, um, and effective strategies because uh, we've had, you know, we have a long history of experiential learning just being part of many of our programs. Mm -hmm. um, but assessment of experiential learning, I think, is, is the thing that we're starting to focus on. Um, okay. And the idea there is to make it more intentional. And that's a little bit about the horror stories of internships where somebody goes and they just become, you know, um, a gopher or doing paperwork or, or that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's not just that, it's more of the, and I put a question in the, in the chat about, or a comment really about this in the chat about um, wanting to make sure that experiential learning is capturing you know, and, and cultivating that kind of workforce readiness, mm -hmm. not only in the sense of being in the setting. So we know that being in the workforce, you know, the workplace, the setting, getting the sense of it, um, what, what the flow is, you know, how you operate as, a, as an individual within the team, um, but also, for example, um, and I, I have in mind general education, because we think of general education as the way we deliver the so-called soft skills. But those, in order for those to be truly transferable into the workplace and to actually become the sorts of things that the employer means, you know, when they're thinking of, of those, um, that's, that's a best practice that I think we're really trying to hone is, is um, not just saying, we have a required internship experience. You get three credit hours. You know, you'll get to know an employer, but being much more intentional about that. So, so having those connections to the curriculum and then the connections yeah. to the employer. That's exactly, and I and that's what was that's what's very exciting about this um, today was um, the opportunity. I like the way this came in as we're NJ Transit, and this is the spectrum of mm -hmm. our workforce needs. Um, I got very excited about that, and I'm going to immediately reach out to our, um, you know, the experiential learning coordinator to say, are we, are we plugged into NJ Transit? Look at this range of things. Let's go to them and find out how we can start to tailor our experiential learning curriculum um, with them, you know, not just, not just the internship agreement, but actually a kind of curriculum for that. Mm -hmm. So that, and I'm going to keep using that word intentional because I think that's what's it's important. Critical mm -hmm. experiential learning doesn't just happen. You know, right. you, you can't, it has to be, um, I think not that it's a curriculum in the sense of a classroom, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the transition from classroom learning to being in the, you know, being in a practicum, um, for the, for the disciplines that, that do that is a very structured thing. Um, is important, but thinking about that across all of those disciplines, that was a, that's a tremendous insight and tremendous opportunity. Absolutely. And I honed in on um, Ariel's comment about, um, no, not Ariel's, like the previous comment about language, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Regina's language, 
comment about adjusting our language. Yes. And I just said, this is it. This is, you know, how we articulate critical thinking teamwork skills in, a in the academic sphere versus what's it look like in the workplace? So that's a long comment, but hopefully we'll spur some others. That was great. And I hope so too. So any, any other thoughts, anyone who wanted to share what their involvement in experiential learning, and it doesn't have to be just internships, right? So experiential learning really can take many different forms. So um, I'm curious to hear from some others that are in the room. Um, I think I just cooked someone. I see, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to unmute Christian. I assume you go by Christian since you have that. Are you willing to share some of your experiences with experiential learning from the employer side? So absolutely. So uh, I'll share a little bit about me, right? So um, I spent the first half of my career in corporate and then into higher education and tailored that based on industry experience and workforce development so we could help build these pathways, right? So I love these types of discussions where we're talking about education, but more importantly now in terms of experiential learning, through opportunities such as pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship. And so what we've done in non-traditional sectors to support our communities, but also the industry critically, is to be able to provide those pathways and learning opportunities for those that may be experiencing challenges, right? So we have to look at a broader picture and spectrum based on what industry is calling for. Um, in education, we love the research. We, we love to be able to do our data and due diligence. Likewise, in industry, similarly, they're doing the same thing and they're communicating the need to be within area specific to how they see that evolution uh, of growth within that industry. So I am speaking, speaking specifically right now to manufacturing and advanced manufacturing in that realm. So when we incorporate a discussion like this, and begin to provide those pathways through valuable partnerships, not only with education, with industry, with our state, with our federal government. These opportunities grow where we can then incorporate that hands-on um, training piece in addition to the foundational curriculum. We need to continue to build, build bridges from those that may not be immediately college bound. So we have both on-ramps and off-ramps. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that and building those partnerships by also partnering with our higher education institutions, both under, undergrad as well as graduate. And we want to be able to build that. We want to be able to talk about STEM and how that leads into manufacturing, where it is within science, engineering, those growth opportunities. So we do that, we continue to build on it, and that's what we're doing in terms of our best practices. But we need to continue as a collaborative Mm -hmm. as a group in the state to be able to acknowledge that when we are putting together something that adds value through apprenticeship, especially registered apprenticeship and national credentialing, such as we do, yes, we need that consistent uh, buy-in from all our educational institutions to partner with industry so that they see the value of that. So that when someone completes a registered apprenticeship, such as ours, which is streamlined, those individuals can then continue to build on their college education through that employer while they're getting paid. And they can do that collectively through, for example, at Hudson County Community College, who we have a partnership with in an articulation agreement, and Middlesex, where they can get up to 12 credits towards their associate's degree. And they can further help that to develop. So those communications and, and that value continues to be a, a central um, mechanism to allow our community members to grow and to be able to be afforded those opportunities to see where they can be in the future. So I think that's the, uh, the importance and the yeah. continued value of what we all do. But we need to come together, acknowledge what industry and intermediaries are doing, such as NJMEP, who I currently work with, and be able to continue to tie that together to our partnerships, strongly with education and within our state that supports apprenticeship. Agreed. And both on the pre-apprenticeship side and the registered apprenticeship side. And we have some valuable discussions with Rowan, Rowan too. So right. I'm and I know Roberta just raised her hand. I unmuted her. I want to thank you because that was a really great perspective. And what you just outlined really just shows 
the purpose and what this the New Jersey Pathways Initiative is, it's linking everything together. It's is being able to show that you can have different, um, like you said, on ramps, educational opportunities. These these ex experiential learning opportunities aren't a, a one and done isolated mechanism with apprenticeships. It's integrated with education and that continuum to continue your education. We are running out of time, so Roberta, quickly, if you wanted to give a closing statement to what Christian was talking about. I just wanted to, you, you stated it very well. I just wanted to amplify that point. Um, and that's something that the four-year institutions are relatively new to is, is um, you know, being plugged into that, to that ecosystem and that ladder. And the, the employers are critical to that and, and organizations like NJMEP. You know, and I think that's the strength of our pathways initiative, yes. right? Like, so we yes. all, whether it's your the community colleges, a four-year institution, our employers, industry organizations, being able to come together and really create that pathway that incorporates all the things that make the future employee an asset to the employer and it make mm -hmm. them more employable. So yep. thank you. We, we really appreciate your perspective. We're going to get back into the main room, but I wanted to just share these closing slides. I know that you have all been uh, very much involved in the initiative. So just quickly, um, there is a feedback form. I'm going to put that in the chat. If I can do that while I'm talking. Um, we really do appreciate and, 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 and acknowledge the need for um, continued, um, I don't say improvement, but getting your feedback and making sure that what we are presenting in the uh, collaboratives is meaningful to all of you. So bear with me because I'm trying to talk and do it at the same time. So there is the link to the, the feedback form. We are also, let me go back over here. Stop sharing and reshare. Bear with me. I know I'm in a, in a race against the clock, so I want to make sure that I get it all in. Um, if you are not on our social media, please do connect with us. We, we appreciate, um, you know, continuing the conversation outside of our collaboratives, but throughout the month on social media with different um, items of interest. And then just want to draw your attention to the next slate of collaborative uh, meetings. So we've got technology and innovation next Wednesday. If you haven't noticed, we've now moved to the Wednesday model. So each Wednesday will be a different um, industry sector. So um, next Wednesday is innovation and technology, the second Wednesday of the month. Third Wednesday, April 20th, Health Services. The fourth Wednesday of the month, Infrastructure and Energy, which by the way, I'm the Director of Infrastructure and Energy, Stephanie Staub. I don't believe that I introduced myself in the beginning. I wanted to get right into the questions and give as much time for all of you to be able to, to, uh, to have an opportunity to talk. And then the next Manufacturing and Supply Chain Collaborative is the first Wednesday of the month. So that would be Wednesday, May 4th. And so we thank you for your time. I think we still have a few minutes left. So if you want to continue the conversation, Roberta, if there was something else that you wanted to say, I think we probably have two minutes before we automatically get moved back over into the main room. Well, I'll, I'll, I'd like to give the opportunity to the others, um, especially I know, Allison, you, you had a comment in the chat about RCBC that- Oh, I missed that. So I will, Allison, please, yeah. we would love to hear from you. I don't know why this isn't working. You know, I think I have to, oh, you're muted now. There we go, Allison. I'm sorry, I'm trying to unmute Allison and it's not working. Catherine, are you able to unmute Allison? I'm clicking the button, but it's not allowing me. We really want to hear from you, Allison. Bear with us. So what Allison had put in the chat was I've asked, I've asked Allison to unmute her. Oh there we go, Allison. You're good to you're good now. You should be able to speak. She put in the check she's having technical Okay. Difficulty. So what Allison had shared in the text, I'll just go ahead and read it, is that um, 
RCBC has an experiential learning coordinator who is currently on maternity leave. I'm excited to listen and relay information to her from this presentation and breakout room. Also, I do know that we regularly receive communication from New Jersey Transit on internships and promote and connect our students with these opportunities. Allison, thank you for being here and relaying that information. And please do um, let your, your, your experiential learning coordinator um, know. Please connect her with New Jersey Pathways if she not or is not already connected with us. Um, our website, I'm sure that you are familiar with the website and um, Glenn's information and John and all of us are posted on our website. You can send messages or connect with us on LinkedIn or just through good old um, email. So we look forward to hearing from her and welcome her back to the important work of experiential learning. Well, we did have some great conversations, Christian and Roberta. We thank you very much for your perspectives. It is great to hear that um, our four-year university partners and our employers, you know, see the tremendous value and the need for experiential learning and what, how it makes um, students more employable and bring value and create assets for you as employers. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work together on the, on the Pathways Initiative in order to continue creating those path, those uh, on-ramps and um, really more innovative experiential learning opportunities for students and connecting all of our ecosystem partners in order to do that. Well, thank you all for your time today. We really appreciate you not only attending the collaborative, but coming into the breakout room and, and, and sharing your perspectives. And we look forward to seeing you on May 4th. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.